Yo, yo, yo. What's up, you guys? It's a new day, a new feeling. And it's, uh, it's March 20th, right? It's, let's just take a look. Yipper, Tuesday, March 20, 1.03 p.m. And I know for sure that I woke up. God's still with me. Thank the Lord. Because I woke up, saw the clock in the distance, and it was 12.37. And yep, that's just God talking to me. I mean, you know, we all have our little ways of seeing symbols and signs and whatnot. Well, you know, my number, since law, so long, has been a number 23. And uh, sometimes the number 23 will coincide with the number 4 or the number 7, typically. And uh, when I see them, then I know, okay, yeah, for sure, for sure, Jah's with me. Because basically, 234, you see, you can see the Psalm 23, and I, you know, I'm always about the Psalm 23. I mean, my favorite thing in the Bible, I think... I think within Psalm 23, you could basically learn almost everything you need to know. Not everything, but I'm saying most, a lot. Psalm 23 is so vital. And I've been all, I've been just on Psalm 23 1 with y'all. But say, I'm just going to speed up a bit. Psalm 23 4, 234 is, you know, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort thee. And I don't know if you've even seen some of my other videos. I mean, I got like 40 walking sticks slash canes slash staffs. And, you know, my form of self-defense is typically, you know, uh, well, the Japanese basically started this style. And I'll tell you why. Because it's significant for what's going on right now. Real significant. I'm glad Job brought it up. Because back in the day when the samurais... We're walking the path in Japan. I don't know. I'm, st I'm thinking like 10, 1,000, I mean, A.D. I don't know, though. Seriously. But there was a time, obviously, in Japan where the samurais would walk the path and they had their swords. And typically, the long sword, you know, that was, I don't know, about 40 inches with the handle, is a katana. You know? And there was another, another name... Tachi, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. So, you know, all you samurai class, don't be jumping at me. I, I, I just, sometimes things pop in my head, you know. I, I, we all see stuff as we go about our day. It all goes in. It goes in. It gets stored, you know, in a hippocampal area, basically. Probably other areas we, we're not familiar with. Because we, we have not mapped the entire brain. Because some of you were deluded about that. It's not a dang quantum computer, I mean, it's like, psh, I can't even say a billion times more powerful and complicated in a sense, you know, just saying it's, it's very, it's just so much to it, and, and really, there's no way to put, like, to put walls around with the potential of the brain, because it, it constantly growing, making new connections, Breaking down old connections. You can't say, oh, we, we've mapped this whole thing. You just can't do it. Anybody that knows anything about brain, chemistry, neuron, the way structures and all that. I'm telling you, you just, you won't, they want to try. They're trying. Like, they're like, we mapped the entire gene code. Okay, all right, all right. But try it with the brain. Ain't going to happen. And you all these quantum computers trying to mimic the potential of the brain, man, all right, do what you got to do. But I'm telling you, the, the potential of brain power is just, that's our CPU of this temple, this this body. It's, it's mind, body, soul, okay? That's your weapon system, mind, body, soul. And, of course, you know, the, the maker of that weapon system is almighty God, Jah above yeah anyway um 
Um, um, yeah, so like I said, I know for sure I woke up today because it was 2.37. And, you know, Psalm 23, 4, of course, is like one of the most significant things. I'm not wearing it now. I don't think I am. Still, I think I'm still wearing my shirt from yesterday. Yep, I am. <laughs> Where? And if you guys think that's weird, you don't even understand. I, I think I wore the same black Adidas nylon, you know, windbreaker type suit when I was a free range feral human in Hawaii. I think maybe for I think a entire year straight, the same thing. Year straight. And yeah, sure, I washed it every day in the toilet. You know, I, was, I think I said. Try to explain that in another. Well, you know, not every day to toilet. Cause sometimes just walk in the, walk in the ocean, walk out, and I took the cotton out the Adidas suit. Cause I had the cotton inside. Some don't, but this did. I bought it in the Alamo. Well, I didn't buy it. I Hawaiian borrowed it <laughs> in uh Alamoana Shopping Center. You know, just went in and borrowed it, and uh, you know. They could come get it. It's somewhere in Hawaii. I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere. They could just go get it. And, uh, it had the cotton inside, and I knew, you know, well, I knew after I tried it, I went in the ocean with it, and it didn't dry for, like, 30 minutes, and I was like, I can't be waiting through because I just had places to go, you know? I was a free-range, feral human. I had places to go and people to see and things to get into. So I cut out the cotton, because Hawaii, you don't need the cotton anywhere. And then I walk in the ocean, come out, and it's like not even five minutes, and you're dry. I mean, you walk out the ocean, you just walk, and you dry while you're walking. Well, you know, my 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 territory, my you know, I told you a free-range Roman feral was UH, which is in the Manoa Valley, about two miles from Waikiki. And basically, it's like here's Waikiki, you know, with the ocean, and then there's like there's there's the valley, you know, you know the ridge on both sides, Tantalus, and then the ridge um, on the other side. I don't, I can't remember the name, but in the middle is Manoa Valley, and that's where the college is, U H Manoa, you know, and um, and there's two ways to get to it, cause right in the middle is this canal, you know, the uh, uh, hmm. I keep thinking Ala Moana, but it might be, it's Alice something. It's a canal, so there's two things to go around the canal to get to the Manoa Valley and then to come back out. So basically, me and my brother, I was with my brother James, who was like brother lions. You know how sometimes lions, usually they they roam on their own to check out the territory, the stomping grounds. Well, I every once in a while you see like brother lions. You know, they go together. That was me and my brother. I mean, my real biological brother, my brother James. And sometimes, you know, I even seen one time, it wasn't just brother lines, it was four of them. And they were so bad, these guys. I mean, that's rare. You don't see lions four. Four, you know? Like that show Divergent. Four. <laughs> and, uh, speaking of, you know, I really like Trish, Trish and Divergent, but... But then, like, I seen her in a movie recently. Girl, you better go eat a sandwich or something. I'm serious. What is going on with you? She's trying to be so dang skinny. It don't look right. And I'm sure, I'm sure you ain't got no energy. I mean, unless you just subsisted on meth and coke or something. And that's going to burn your ass out. <laughs> Damn. Y'all need to eat some sandwiches. I don't know where you got it in your head. Skinnier is better. Well... I know where you got it in your head, man. Some dang women's magazines and whatnot. You know, stupid. You know, just be healthy. Don't be embarrassed of your size. I'm plus size. I'm large and charged. And I don't even care. I mean, my whole life, you know, I was an athlete. I mean, that's that was my thing. And my mom was real healthy. I mean, what my friends used to complain. Because they, they come over, and when they go over each other's house, they always had like pepperonis and, and all this stuff in the fridge and they could just you go to your friend's house man it's all about man what you got in your fridge right right am I right you want to see all kind of foods because we all about foods when we were kids and kind of snacks they got right well they come to my house and they did not even like it in fact 
I had a friend named Frank Cirillo. His dad said he can't even come to my house no more because we didn't even have proper food. <laughs> what a joker, man. Just because my mom bought, bought like a 20-pound crate of grapes and put it on the porch and a big thing of apples because, like I said, my, my town in South Jersey, we were, we, were, we were right between Atlantic City and Philadelphia, exit 38, almost halfway between Philadelphia and Atlantic City. But it was basically like a 10,000 person town, and it's mostly just Italians and Sicilians, and a lot of blueberry fields, because blueberries grow real well in the pine barren so soil. It's very unique. They figured it out, and they know, damn, we could be blueberry dons. We're just going to bam, bam, bam. So it's like the blueberry capital of the world. Well, that's what it says on a sign when you go into town. <laughs> but it is. It's just blueberries. I mean, we grew up packing blueberries. We didn't pick them. I mean, that was for, like, you know, the Mexicanos, man, the Holmeses. They did the picking. Or they had the big machine. But most of us kids, we did the packing. Bat, bat, bat. Bat, bat, bat. Bat, bat, bat. There's 22 cents for you. <laughs> it's like robots. But anyway, what I'm saying is that Italian peoples, I mean, lots of cultures like the farm. and But, I mean, you go to my town... And basically, almost everybody have a little garden in the backyard. I mean, my grandma, she, she didn't have a big house at all. It's a tiny little house. But, it was very, like, the, she kept everything real nice. She loved roses. There was a nice fig tree. And my grandfather, I mean, you know, Jack took him, put him to sleep when I was only six. It was like 1980, about you know, so I really didn't get to know him. But here's the thing: it, it's said in, in developmental psychology that the first six years of your life are the most vital. That's when you do the heavy, heavy learning and and whatnot, and the heavy development. And so I got real lucky because my grandfather, he's not just like normal grandfathers. My nono, he's like, man, man. I was six. I was only six. I wish I, could, I wish I could get to know the dude more, but who knows, you know? Let's just see what happens, right? Maybe Jai will wake him up, and we could just be... I could hang out on my nono, the kingdom of heaven on earth. Yep, burr, we'll see. And, uh, but anyway, my grandma, she had this, this garden in the back. It was a vegetable patch, basically. It wasn't very big. I mean, think, think like, 8 to 10 feet by... Six to eight feet. It's not a lot, right? But it was like she wanted it not even one weed. Not even one weed. And of course, weeds just grow every day. But that was my thing. You know, every day we had to go out and she gave me the hoe. And I had the hoe. Boom. Boom. The whole thing. You know, like I said, it's not that much. But that was when she wanted to plant something new. But in between those, it was, yeah, I had to go pick, 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 put them in a trash bag, you know. And by the end, I'm telling you, it, the trash bag was full. Because weeds, they just, and she didn't, she wasn't really into, like, spraying, you know, like they do, what do you call it, the, like, you know, the chemicals that kill weeds. She didn't ever, 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 not even one time, spray her vegetable patch with nothing. It was just... It was just rain, and and that was it, really. I mean, no, but, like, I don't know. She probably maybe fed him. I don't remember. I was a little kid. But, I mean, you know, she never used no damn chemical spray. She used me. <laughs> I was the weed killer. Yeah, so, um, man, sometimes I get on things, and I, I really... Okay, so yeah, I, I just wanted to tell you, it's like, I know for sure I woke up, and God was just, because yeah, Psalm 234, and then 237, we all know 777 is the number for God. We do know that, I mean, come on, seven days of creation, and, and with Noah, it was, it was, most people think, you know, with the animals, it was uh, one of each, a male and a female, but if you read carefully, you'll see, it, a lot of it was seven. There's seven sevens. And of course, we know the seven theme in the Bible. Come on. I mean, come on. Um, 
See the angels with the seven seals. Babylon is all fall down, fall down. Babylon is all fall down. Bam! That's from the Rasta Man chant. You know? And I'm, I can't even say give Bob Marley credit because that's just the Rasta Man chant. You know, I don't know who, who started it, but that was his version. You know? See the angels with the seven seals. You got the seven bowls. You know, you got the, uh, you got the just seven, 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 seven is blasting everywhere. That's God's number. You know? And we know that the number of the beast is 666. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or maybes. It's just right there in Revelation. The number of the beast is 666. That's why the hexagonic star, a.k.a. the star of Rem Fan, as seen in Acts 743, a.k.a. the synagogue of Satan, Fake Jew, Khazar's version, the Star of David, which is not, of course, because, you know, we see the Star of Rem family when Solomon, one of God's, was one of God's favorites, but he went and started messing with occult Babylon nonsense, and his son Menelik was like, nah, Dad, what are you doing, man? You're tripping. He took the Ark of the Covenant. He took it to Ethiopia. Well, a, a lot of them will say, well, that's where it is today, but, you know. You see him on like the Discovery Channel, <laughs> so funny too. And you see like one old, <laughs> you see like some one old Ethiopian dude, you know, he's just standing in front of in front of this gate that comes up to his knees, and it's like this broke down old. It looks like one of them rich people's place where you put they put the, their uh, family's bodies. We call them things mausoleum. They're standing in front of him and being like, man, that's where the Ark of the Covenant is. <laughs> I love it. So it's like, oh, okay. You're telling me like <laughs> the mo one of the most important things in entire history, the Ark of the Covenant, is just in just in the <laughs> just in that little structure right there. And there's some old Ethiopian dude with his his staff is protecting it. <laughs> Oh man, something's so funny. Oh boy. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> Malik was the son of Solomon and Sheba. And you know, it's funny how things work. Because, okay, when I, it was about, it was right before Y2K, because I was there when Y2K happened. I like to say, a lot of times, a lot of stuff happened around Y2K. I always say, it was around Y2K. I don't know, I could say it was around the year 2000. It just comes out. It was around Y2K. So I'm in upstate New York. Ithaca, New York. Because, um, basically, this was, like I said, like, 1999-ish. And, um, basically, like, you know, I went to University of Hawaii between, you know, um, uh, spring 1993. I got there December 26, like I explained in another video. Got there December 26. And then the spring semester started, like, I don't know, like, January 8th. So I had a little bit to, you know, cruise around. I stayed in some doctor's uh, room in Kaneohe Bay, which didn't exactly work out for some because Kaneohe Bay is a pretty good ways away from the U.S. The first night there, got off the plane, went to the YMCA, <laughs> and uh, spent one night there. And um and I really didn't even spend a night because I got there and it was it was uh it was like it was like three in the morning. I just threw my bags down. I was like, I gotta explore. This is Hawaii. And I just like uh the YMCA is like in Honolulu and I just started walking and it was so warm, it was lovely, it was beautiful, I was feeling the Hawaii vibe, it was awesome. And I ended up because I knew a friend from Pedophile Prep. A.K.A. Mercersburg Academy. His name was Jan. Jan, uh... Jan some. He was on the swimming team. And the thing about pedophile prep is they had, like, the number one swimming team for, I don't know, East Coast prep schools or something. It was always them and Petty School, which was basically right next to Princeton in New Jersey. Which is like, you know, it was only like 40 minutes from where I grew up. And so, it well, yeah, well, it made sense that I would go to Petty instead of all the way four hours to Mercer. But my front, my mom knew someone that went 
her kid went to Mercersburg and she respected this person. That's why we ended up in Mercersburg and not Petty. You know. Same way, it was always Mercersburg and Petty when it came to the best swimming team. And uh this kid Jan was like a swimming master. He was a master. And I'll never you know, he was so unique too because I'm going to put him on blast a little bit, but I don't care because he shouldn't be worried about his reputation. I'm sure he is. He's some kind of doctor. I didn't, I didn't keep tabs on him, man. Because the, the way he acted when I seen him in Hawaii, I was like, like I said, it was 1992, about to turn 1993. And I just go on this walk from the YMCA, I ended up in Waikiki somehow. Cause see, see that? Read that? Read it? John walks in mysterious ways. I just was walking. It was dark. I ended up in Waikiki. And... And I even, I was walking around, and there was a, I was like, well, he's got to be in one of these hotels, right? And there was a guy, like a big Hawaiian, sitting on a thing. And um, I was like, do you know where the Harvard, because he went to Harvard. Do you know where the Harvard swimming team is staying? And he's like, right there. And I, I don't know, I just ended up at this dang hotel. And I walk up, that's what happens in Hawaii, man. Because I've I never been in Hawaii. It just grabbed me up and was like, you in the flow now, son. And I walk up the stairs, and I didn't get his door first, but I, but I got some other dude. I woke him up. Like I said, wasn't even, wasn't even, you know, it was like, at this point, I don't know, like 4 a.m., 5 a.m. It was almost close to sun, I remember. I'll tell you why in a second. Knock, knock, knock. Some dudes, I was like, yo, he's, he's the Harvest Swim Team, right? Where's Jan? Jan S-Way. That's his name. And, and, and. And I was more friends with his little brother, Brian. Brian that's way. And I think he went to I think he went to uh University of Texas. Cause they they was all swimmers. Brian was a cool little brother, man. You know why? Because he was real humble. I mean, you know, I was a senior when I knew Brian and I lived up on the third floor with my two ferrets, Pipeline and Fungul. And he used to come in. You know, he was a real serious kid. That's why I loved this kid. He was so funny. He was always worried about stuff. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I wonder if you had a heart attack by now, Brian. Because he was always worried about everything. But I loved it. Because he was unique. And I didn't care. I mean, he's just... That was his flight. That was his thing, you know? But every night at 10 o'clock... See, we got... Between 10 o'clock and 10.30... The, the, the two pizza places in town... It's a small little town that this pedophile prep was called Mercersburg. There's two pizza places, Romeo's and Fox's. And see, they'd send the dude with the deliveries because everybody would call in and say, I want this pizza or sandwich. And then between 10 and 10 30, they come deliver it to all the dorms. First stop here, then go to this dorm, this dorm, and everybody would come out to the pizza car. You know? And for me, because. I wasn't like a lot of these kids at, at Pedophile Prep with unlimited size pockets. I mean, so my thing was a personal pizza. It was only one dollar. And it was good. It was like, you know, it didn't fill up a high school man, boy who's an athlete, you know. But it did enough to, I mean, because last time you ate was like 6 o'clock. And, uh, you know, about 10 you're getting hungry, you know. Some, most was studying. I don't know. I did a little studying, but I did a lot of lacrosse catching. But anyway, Brian will come in at about 10 o'clock. Bit, bit, bit. Yo, Chuck, what are you doing, you know? Um, I ordered you a personal. That's right, because he used to get me personals. And he also used to have these little cracker snacks. He used to bring me one. He was a real cool dude, man. He was humble. And I'm not saying, like, you know, he was like my, my subject. Nah, man, I'm not saying. I'm just saying he was he was a youngin', okay? And at prep school, it was like a lot of seniors would take advantage. Be like, ah, hazing it's called. You know what I'm talking about. I didn't do that. I wasn't into that. But a lot of, some of these youngsters, they just want to, you want to show your elders respect. I mean, that's mainly I did. When I was a freshman, my friend name was Drew Gibson. And we had a senior, his name was Lance. I don't know his last name, but he was a big, strong football guy. And 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 uh 
we 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 loved him. We just loved him because he let he let us kind of like attack him. You know what I'm saying? Because it was like a thing. Can you wrestle Lance to the ground? Because we try, we grab him. We could never get him down to bend his knees and go down. We just could not. He was. We were. Man, when I started at pedophile prep, I was like, hold on. That's the first period of hockey game, y'all. Man, I'm just going off on all kinds of tangents. I don't even know why I started this thing, to be honest with you. But, here we go. Oh, it was 25 minutes, a little bit more than the first period of hockey game. But anyway, Lance was like, he liked it when we attacked him, you know. And it was both of us. So we were just little, tiny, little freshmen. Me, myself. I was like maybe, oh man, I don't even know, probably like 5'4", 100 pounds. Yeah, I wasn't even, I don't think I was even 100 pounds when I was a freshman. I was skinny and tiny. And uh, Drew was a little bit bigger, but not much. So we couldn't wrestle him to the ground. We couldn't get him, you know, like lions try to pull down to the ground. We couldn't do it until, and I'll tell you in a second. But it was like, you know that movie with the uh, the French private eye, Inspector Clouseau, and he's got that uh, he's got that like butler, the Chinese guy, and he, and, he, and the butler is always attacking him when he's not looking, <laughs> and that's how he keeps on his toes. Well, that was like Lance and me and uh, Drew Gibson was 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 the butlers, okay, and we and and we finally got him down. And it was after he graduated, we, 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 we decided, this is our last chance. Let's go get him. And he was talking to someone else, probably a girl, because he was the ladies' man, Lance. And uh, he had his back turned. And you don't turn your back on no damn lepers. You know better than that. So we was like, we got this is it. This is our last chance, and we ain't going to see him no more. We got all this kind of... Life force, we was like, yeah. we just mustered, bam, attacked him, and uh, we just got him this time. We just got him. We kept, we just kept at it, and finally he came. We he came down, and not only did we get his knees down, we got his face down. Everything, we got him all down. We was pushing on his, pushing on his face. Now what, Lance? Cause you don't understand. I mean, we had, we had been going at this damn Lance's. All year, and like I said, you know, he graduated. It was, it was from the start to the finish, and we got him, and we had face in the ground. What, Lance? What? It was sort of like Brazilian, you know, indigenous populations rite of passage. That's what it's called, you know. The, some of them brilliant indigenous peoples are nuts. You know what I seen? You know how they get the the kids. It's like eight years old. They made these special gloves, right? Special gloves. And inside, they took these ants that bite. The bite is supposed to be the most painful thing ever. They took these ants and somehow joined them together. You know, interlocked them inside the glove, right? Made these kids... Stick the hands in the gloves, yeah, yeah, and then just go flick, flick to the glove, get the ants all ornery, and the kid would have to just hold his hands and be like, bam, bam, just ants biting. And the kid would have to be like, ah, he start screaming, I don't blame him, he start crying, ah, some of them. There was one, one little dude, he was, man, he was a tough little guy, he was like, rah. Rah, these ants don't hurt me. But, you know, there's another little kid. I guess that's that, that's one of the ways they tell who's going to be, like, one of the stronger, per se. I don't want to say stronger, because everybody's got their own little job to do. Maybe maybe the kid that cried might have been, like, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he was, like, the dude that, that made clothes. <laughs> I mean, you gotta have, you gotta have clothes makers. <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm saying. Anyway, rite of passage. That was like our rite of passage. Me and Drew Gibson. We took Lance down, shoved his face in the ground, said, "What now, sucker?" 
Anyway, I probably started a story, and now, you know, I could, like, wait to get back to it, but, eh, you know. So, moving on, moving on, God's with her, and what I was gonna do. Oh, yeah, the first thing was, uh, I'm feeling a little bit, tiny bit, uh, self-conscious. Just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. I mean, I'm not really the subconscious type, in case you haven't realized. And, uh, but I did see, you can see I did the little trim trim with the goatee tee. And, uh, you know, I, I, there was a time around 1995, my hair was all dreaded out with the red dreads. Like, like in The Simpsons. What's that guy? Sideshow Bob. I looked exactly like Sideshow Bob. Ha <laughs> ha. And, uh, you know, it's when I did my smuggling, you know, Lisquiti Island BC buds from, from, uh, Victoria, Vancouver Island to Hawaii in a basketball, in a bike tires, in a stuffed animal, which I don't know how made the three week journey through customs because it smelled, you could smell from 10 feet away because I, I wrapped laundry dryer sheets around you know, the little balls of herb, because there's always a pound. And I wrapped the dryer sheets around and stuffed them in a stuffed animal. And there was this girl. And I ain't never gonna forget her, because <laughs> I stayed at my friend Jude's house in Victoria. And I, when I woke up, she's walking around naked. <laughs> totally naked. And she was beautiful. <laughs> anyway, she come and sit down right next to me, drinking her tea. Her little herbal teas. And uh, I'm just like, uh, I was like Beavis, man. You know, I'm like, <laughs> and, uh, but there was, there was one thing that kind of calmed me down. I don't know anybody who's been around like these these people that call themselves the family, like the super hippies. Did they, they got on this thing where they just ate like raw garlic, and and they'd be smelling like garlic. And you know, man, I'm telling you, I'm I might not be like technically a vampire, but I don't know who find, who would find a smell of garlic coming out armpits and body orifices attractive because I didn't. <laughs> so here on the one hand, this girl is just absolutely phenomenally beautiful, and but she smelled like garlic and she's got the hairy armpits. Man, it was really weird, man. It kind of like messed with me a little bit. I was like, is she... And, do I, do I want some? Do I not want some? Do I want some? <laughs> but anyway, um, I just told her, I was like, hey, do you know how to sew? Because I didn't, I mean, I know how to sew. Who doesn't? You just stick it through the needle. Speaking of needles, did you know that, that here's, here's what I was just thinking. The most, the one Bible verse that nobody wants to acknowledge. Nobody. And I know you already know what I'm about to say. You will not, you will not make it through the doors into heaven on earth, okay? If you are wealthy, monetarily speaking, lots of forms of wealth, knowledge, and, uh, you know, stuff. But if you're monetarily wealthy, uh-uh-uh, what's it say? Chances of a, what is it, a camel, maybe? of a camel going through the eye of a needle is greater than a rich person, wealthy person monetarily getting into heaven. And guess what? Those are not just like, oh, okay, well, what, you know, those are just words saying, you know, don't focus on money. No, 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 no. Please take that as literal as it is. You will not ever see me carrying cash. Well, cash is just you know, Illuminati spells on cotton and linen. I mean, they got the the mint where they make the paper 24-7, the so-called Federal Reserve, you know, which is just Rothschild's, you know, you know, money lending, uh, you know, fractional money lending system. But, uh, but what I'm saying is where they print the cash, they got witches, they got Illuminati he witches and she witches, specialists, and all they do is chant on the cash. 24-7, they pumping out the cash. And the witches just be like, 
blah 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 abracadabra with all that stuff. And so, you know, and take a, we all know, everybody knows that the, on the dollar bill is all occult symbols and Illuminati symbols. We all know that. With what you don't know is, is it was all chanted on. It was chanted on, man. Spell works. Cash is spell works. You won't be seeing me carry no cash. In fact, I had a, I had a, a dude that, that I don't want to make it sound like that his only purpose was to carry, carry the money, you know? But, because I really love him very much. His name, I called him Sutherland. Sutherland. This was 1999. And I was in Iowa. I was in, I was in that, that TM hub. Fairfield, Iowa, and uh, I call him Sutherland, and I don't, I don't even know his real name. If I did, I would find his little ass and tell him we got stuff to do. I need my, I need my money carrier. I need my treasurer. I called him my treasurer, and I don't mean to make him. I don't mean to be little because he was one of my favorites ever, ever. He still is. I think about him, Sutherland, and I called him Sutherland. Because he looked exactly like Kiefer Sutherland's father, Donald. I mean, you know how they got the lips with the little, it looked like I squished together? You know, Donald Sutherland. He looked like a young, when Donald Sutherland was young, you know? He looked exactly like him. And he was only 15 years old, you know? And we used to go to the store, you know? And I had a lot of these little high school kids that liked to hang with me because when they go home, all they get is is did you do your meditation did you do your you gonna when you gonna learn your siddhis your yoga flying Cause these jokers man they think they they think they'll keep practicing with these you know mantras that one day they're just gonna start hovering they really do believe that that you don't even understand what they, they believe they think that one day because they read in the book like by Yogananda or these people from India that tell them that they 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 can uh, levitate. They be, they buy that, you know. Let me tell you, and it's not. You don't have to be stupid to buy into that, you know. One of them dudes they ran for president. He's a Harvard physicist named John Hagelin. He's not stupid, but he thinks that too. I don't know. Maybe maybe he figured it out, and he still want to have his power position. I don't I don't know what he's thinking. But there's a lot of smart, some of the so-called, you know, academically smartest from Stanford, whatever. They, they buy into this thing that, because the way Maharishi put it at him. See, Maharishi had a physics degree. So he put it at him scientifically. He knew that was a way to grab him up. You know, I mean, his book was named The Art of Living, The Science of Being. He knew all right, I'm going to come and try to get all these followers, you know, you know, and be basically big, the big, I'm going to be the biggest vampire of them all, right, the biggest false prophet of them all, and he was one of them, Maharishi, he's dead now, sucker, and, uh, you know, and that guy Deepak Chopra, a lot of people were like, oh man, he's, he's great, you know, there was a time in 1991, I was telling you how I worked the Carney game on the Tennessee Pier in Atlantic City. Well, when I was waiting for so-called victims to come in to play the basketball game or the the uh, wiffle ball off the stop sign game that I was sitting at, sitting on my um, stool waiting, I would be reading Deepak Chopra's book, Quantum Healing, because like I was telling you, I always wanted to be a doctor, and I was fascinated. What's this mind-body medicine stuff? Right, because he was talking about, well, most doctors just concentrate on the body, but they don't understand that the mind and the body work together. And I was like, yeah, well, I could see that. And so that's how I, that's how I got into neuroscience, is is from that book, Quantum Healing. You know, in fact, when I, when I went to sit down with with Dr. Blanchard the first time, when he was like, he was like, who's this freshman? 18 year old that think he's gonna come work in my lab and all that guy's a bunch of PhD people from all over earth and people masters Errol Yudko about to get his PhD and whatnot who's this freshman think he is well I sat down with him 
and I don't know, full disclosure, I might have been might have been after I smoked a little cannabis. Cause at that time I smoked a little cannabis, I got I got real like good with words and some people they can't they get the opposite, they get like uh, but not me. I mean I opened a lot of doors with smoking a little herb and then going in <laughs> and uh talking, you know, to to uh people. Cause I just you know, whatever. But uh so I'm sitting down in his office, you know, Dr. Robert Blanchard, and uh, and I'm trying to explain why it would be in his best interest to take me on. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I got a 4.0, you know, and but um, I went to this prep school, and you know, this and that, and I'm like, but I, I really want to learn about this mind-body medicine, and I read this book, Quantum Healing by Deepak Chopra, and I start explaining to him what I learned about, um, you know, the way that uh, a neuron fires. I could tell him the whole process, and he was like, damn, I got, I got students, three, third year students, they can't, they can't explain the, the all or none principle of the way a neuron fires through the axon, and, you know, and this and that, but I could, I could just go, bam, bam, I could just bust it out for him, and he was like, all right, he kicked back, he's like, and I remember, because he said, uh, he said you're gonna need any money and I didn't expect that at all I mean I was I was ready to volunteer man I mean this was like he was the man Dr. Blanche was the man oh he's the big man on campus when it came to research and I was looking for a researcher you know and there was only one other person I was considering because see what I did was the psychology department printed me out this thick thing of all the researchers and what they was getting into. And I narrowed it down to two. I narrowed it down to uh, uh, neurobiology, which was, as was Dr. Blanchard, the Beckesy Lab was the Beckesy Lab of neurobiology. But I was also interested in personality psychology, which always fascinated me. You know, person, you know, because that's like, you know, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you know of course that joke of Freud and that 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 Busta Young you know them them guys you know but I was fascinated by all that all that stuff about how dreams is interpreted so we had we had a teacher and he was the personality of psychology master blaster and his name was Anthony Shapiro I can't believe I remember because like I said it was 1993 but you know, honestly, my memory's seriously like a steel trap. You know, it doesn't come like that, but sometimes I'll just pause for a second. I'll just stick it right in my brain. I don't even, I mean, my hippocampus that's like intact is probably just jaw going, bam, bam, there you go. That's the way I like to think of it. Anyway, his name was Anthony Shapiro, professor of personality and psychology. Best, maybe the best professor I've ever had besides... Well, there's a couple, but his thing was, he would lecture, you know, 200 people, and he would write an outline on a, a blackboard. He would use chalk. He would write the whole class outline, and then as he was speaking, and like I said, Anthony Shapiro, what's that sound like? Well, it could either be Jewish or Italian, right? Basically, Shapiro, but I think, you know, I'm pretty sure he was Italian in the way the way he had a lot of life force, you know, because, you know, the, the synagogue of Satan's the fake Jews, most of them ain't got lots of life force, man. That's, you know, Italians do, though. Italians as soon as we got life force. We bring it. Them Jewish people are like, eh, me, 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 me. Just look at Woody Allen, man. He's a little damn pedophile freaker. Man, I, I, you know, my brother, he's like, he's like, Masters in screenwriting, so he watch. He's in. A, he can watch all kinds of movies. If I see a movie that's made by Woody Allen, I don't care even if it has Scarlett Johansson with her beautifulness. I will not watch it. No way. If it says Woody Allen, I ain't watching that. With all the mini, 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 it's just driving me up the wall, man. But you know, maybe y'all like that flow. What do they call that? Neurotic? The Jewish neuroticus? 
does it drive me up the damn wall? Wanna torture me, man? Just put on a dang Woody Allen movie. Shit. But yeah, so he probably he probably uh Italian. Now watch, someone's gonna come. I knew Anthony Shapiro, he was a Jew. <laughs> okay, but but he was a real powerful speaker. I mean he mesmerized us, but he would go to the blackboard and be like Boom, and then tell us about that little section, and then go back to the blackboard. Boom, and I used that one time when I got to the University of Vermont. I took a class called developmental. Say, like, oh, there go period two. There go. That's a good the way it resets on me. You might you might ask, well, why don't he just reset? You know that thing. Well, because it, you know, if I'm going off on one of my little flow flow tangents, it gives me a chance to pause. But real quick. I transferred to University of Vermont because this is a good method. If any of y'all ever have to give a speech in front of a lot of people and you're scared and you're shitting yourself, yeah, because I was. I'm going to tell you, University of Vermont, developmental psychology, there's about 300 kids. I was so scared. She, she said, y'all are going to have to give a speech. You're going to have to prepare some. And I was like, damn. For me, it was like a band-aid. You just want to rip it off. She's like, who wants to go first? And I'm like, me. <laughs> I want to get it out of the way so I can enjoy the rest of the dang semester. So I had to prepare. And my thing was, um, is developmental psychology. My thing was, my little speech was about how kids, okay, yeah, because of their drug problem. You know, why, why is everybody all these drugs? Because we have this thing where we want to seek with so-called altered states of consciousness. We just wanna, we go about our days, and a lot of, we get bored, so we wanna feel something different, you know, powerful. So when we're a little kid, what I, my, my whole point was, it's not just something that you do when you're an adult. You, it's an innate, it was innate, versus, it was nurture versus nature, okay? That's what it was. And basically that just means, is this an, something you are born with, this instinct to act this way? Or is this something you learn nature versus innate, you're born, or, um, you know, nature, you learn it. Okay? So that was what it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a nature versus nurture. And I was like, this thing about wanting altered states of consciousness and doing all these drugs, it come, it's an innate thing. Because when you're a kid, somebody tell me you didn't do this when you was a kid. Spin around real fast, right? So as you want to fall down and be like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> We all did it, right? Or you ask your dad, spin me, spin me, spin me, spin me. Well, that's just a part of the innate thing. You want to feel something different from your everyday sameness. You want to feel something just blast you. It's, it's an innate thing. So I had to give my speech about that. So what I did was, like I said, it was like 300 kids. And I was scared as shit. Um, I put it all on the uh, blackboard. We had an old blackboard. I, it was, I put it on the blackboard like he did, like Shapiro did. And I got up there. And, and, you know, I was so scared. Let me just show you. I was so scared. I had a, I had a little ball. Because, I yeah, boys and their balls. I know. But I do like these. I like I used to carry my little ball around. It was a little Nerf kind of ball. I carried it everywhere at University of Vermont. I mean, if anybody knew me there, like this girl I was with, Allison, I had my little ball all the time. So when I got up to give a speech, who gives a speech with a little ball? I did. I had to. I was scared. So I'm walking around, and I just wanted to just spit it out. And I had my little ball... It's like that, that from Snoopy Linus and his comfortable blanket, or that that movie Mr. Mom, and Michael Keaton's boy had that blanket he didn't want to get rid of, and Mr. Mom was always like, "What do you call it? his woogie? His woogie? His woogie? When are you gonna get rid of your woogie?" And the kid would be like, "Nah, nah, my woogie." And then and then like something happened, and the kid was like. Take my woogie, you can have it now, you know what I'm saying? So that was my woogie. And, um, uh, anyway, 
shorten it up. I did my speech, and it went great. And all right, full disclosure, I may have. I mean, I don't know. It's just coming in my brain. I don't know. Maybe, maybe snorted like ten milligrams of Ritalin <laughs> before my speech. <laughs> that may have it aided me a tiny bit. You know, Ritalins kind of help you focus. <laughs> so. Yeah, so there's that. Guess what? I got a fucking applauses, man. It was only a five minute thing, but everybody was like, the kids were like, <laughs> and then I even had girls coming up to me, which was really cool, man. I remember, because girls like when a man can go up and do something that normal people are scared to do, like give a speech. Like, the girls, real beautiful couple of them, beautiful girls, was like, hey. Your name is Charlie, right? And I was like, wow, all right, I'm going to give some speeches more often. <laughs> but I got it. I didn't just get it. I got a 20 out of 20. A plus, plus, plus. Trey. Trey. Yeah, because it was, you know, some of y'all might be, but well, it was the Riddler. You know, but I'm telling you, it was, it was Anthony Shapiro's outline. It was my little ball woogie. I mean, it was all of it. You know, it's real hard to just say something was because of one thing. I mean, it's always a combination of things. I just move over a little bit so you can see the leopards. See how cool that is? My mom gave me that for, I don't know, my birthday or Christmas or something. You see, it's like a mama leopard and a little cub. You know, my mom gave it to me. Obviously, I'm the little cub and she's the mama leopard. Pretty nice, right? It's all framed up. Anyway... Man, it's already in the second period of this hockey game, and I don't... Why did I even start this thing? And Alright, I gotta turn my fan up, you guys, because, cause, uh, like I said, it's probably like closing in on 2 in the afternoon here. North Carolina. I can feel it. I can feel it. And uh, like I said, just woke up, so... You know. But yeah, I wanted to tell you... I did a little trim trim on my goatee. I was feeling a little self-conscious. Because I guess it don't look all that bad. When I was doing it, I was like, oh man, I don't know how to do this properly. Because I have friends, see? In South Jersey, I'm going to just give him a little a little tag real quick. His name is Joey Bartuccio. Bartuccio. And if that don't sound Italian, I don't know what does. Some people call him Tooch. Tooch. I call him, I call him, uh, Call him Joe. And, uh, you know, it's hard not to say little dude, really. And I don't mean that as a, in a negative way. But, you know, you know, it, uh, Joey's a little dude, okay? I mean, like, it, you know, I asked him one time if he was in the UFC, because he liked, he liked MMA too. You know, I was like, if you were in the UFC, what weight class would you be? He said, I'd be a bantam weight. That means 135 pounds. So yeah, obviously. I mean, I'm, a, I'm like 100 kilograms. You know, I'm like 240. You know, I'm like 100 more pounds than him. So that's why I call him a little dude. And like I said, I'm like 6 foot 1 and a half. And he's like, damn. I don't know, 5'5 five, five maybe. He's just a tiny little dude, like I said. But I don't mean that. I don't mean it in a negative way because he was one of my good friends. You know, and... And, and when I say good friends, I also want to say he was a he was a dang he was a dang backstabbing little thief. But I don't mean that in a negative way either, because I got a lot of respect for thieves. You know, it says Jesus come like a thief in the night, and and and, and uh, you know, I got a lot of respect for thieves because I don't I don't I don't uh, I don't. Uh, I don't care about the laws of man. You know, like Bob Marley talks about the laws of man. I care about the laws of God, you know? And yeah, there was like 600 laws of Moses, but after Jesus came, after Jesus gave his sacrifice and blood, there's really only two, there's, there's a couple more than two. But the two most important laws are, number one, the big one, no other gods but Jah, the Abrahamic God. Okay, the God of David, the God of Jacob, that's that's it. No other gods, so all your Malachas and Rem fans, man, none of that's good. It's just Jah. 
The other one is love your brother and sister. Like love your neighbor, love your brother and sister. Try to help each other. And that's it. Those are the two. After Jesus gave a sacrifice, that's it. And a lot of a lot of people when they start up with the you know, well don't eat pork and don't do this because the it was the law of Moses. There's a word for that, there's a term for that. It's called Judaiz Judaizing. Judaizing. Because what you're doing basically is trying to bring things back the way before Jesus with all the 600 laws of Moses. Just discounting it, Jesus gave his blood for us. For a restart, fresh start. Focusing on them two laws I just mentioned. That's called Judaizing. Alright? So, be on the lookout for that. When, when someone's be like, Well, you just did that. And it's one of the 600 laws of Moses. You ain't no righteous person, man. Just be like, man, you have no idea what you're talking about. Jesus gave his life. So we have to deal with 600 some laws of Moses no more. All these complicated Jewish, fake Jews and synagogue of Satan, Khazars with all them little laws. You know, and now, now with America and all its little laws. You know, and I don't, I really don't want to like sound like I'm anti-American. I just want to show you something. You know, this is my, this is my number one hat for obvious reasons. UVM lacrosse. You know, but look right there. You see it? You see it? So anyone that's that's gonna start up with the, oh, you are anti-American, man. You don't even know, man. Anybody that serves with the special forces is not anti-American. But you see, you don't even understand. John F. Kennedy started the Special Forces to fight tyranny on the home front. Yeah, most Special Forces go on missions around the world. But the reason JFK, because he saw what was going on. He saw the so-called deep state military industrial complex start getting their claws and everything. And he said, damn, I'm going to start this thing called Special Forces. And their main purpose is if one day the NWO starts trying to with, come with the tyranny on our on its own peoples, anybody who's been in the special forces, right there they go, bam. That's my that's my call. That's my the phone rang. I gotta get up and go help my my the the citizens per se, the people that aren't in the special forces. This is, I gotta go help them, because the tyranny, you know, martial law, you know, FEMA camps, blue, red, pink stickers on your mailboxes, you know, NWO, Agenda 21. Special Forces was started by JFK, and they did not like that. And that was just one of the reasons that he got did wrong. Because JFK started... He was just another stooge, you know. He, he came from he came from like a vampire family, the Kennedys. But he changed when he got his power position, and he tried towards the end to start turning it around, and doing good. I mean, it was him that started with the whole fake moon thing to begin with, because he was a puppet. But toward the end, I mean, they're not gonna kill someone off if they're doing what they want them to do, right? Does that make sense? Does it? Yeah, well, you know, the same thing goes with Stanley Kubrick. He was the one responsible for filming the fake moon landing and all kinds of other stuff for them. He was the director in charge of all that Illuminati stuff. But time came, and who knows why, maybe his kids, you know, he was like, I can't do this. So, in his movies, he started... By putting little hints for us. Puzzle pieces. And now a lot of us are doing YouTube videos. Talking about what did Stanley Kubrick mean. What was he saying. And then of course. It all came to a climax. With his movie Eyes Wide Shut. With that damn Scientology puppet Tom Cruise. Who I, lo I love Tom Cruise. Since I was a kid man. I love his fluff in Tropical Thunder. When... When um, Ben Stiller had to do act like the, the the retard, you know, with the buck teeth, and he and he said he called his agent who was Tom Cruise, and he was like, "No, I'm sorry, Matthew McConaughey was his agent, 
but Tom Cruise was like in charge of the whole company. And he was like, they're holding me hostage. And, 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 and the little, the little Thailand terrorist was like, was like, you know, we got, we got your, uh, you know what I'm saying, the negotiations. And then Tom Cruise busted off with the dance. <laughs> and there's lots of gifts on Facebook with that dance that he did. And he was just, he was like, and Tom, Tom Cruise just went, he just, he was all in it. It was awesome. It was probably, it was maybe the best little dance dance that I that I seen. Seriously, I if I'm gonna do a gif on Facebook, I I use that Tom Cruise dance so many times. I mean, usually I use I use the mountain lion in the tree. It's like, rawr, rawr, I love it. I usually use that if I want to say something and I need to put an exclamation point. I just put the the puma. I just type puma on the gif. And it comes up, and he's like, Rawr! on the snow. Because I think what happened was, these the scientists, they try to, they try to like weigh the mountain lion, so they, they get their dogs to chase the mountain lion, and the mountain lion ain't got like the, uh, can't run as long as dogs, because of the way their lungs and everything, their muscles, energy, ATP, the, the, they're, they're meant to, to, to pounce and attack short distances, whereas dogs can go for like wolves, miles and miles. What's that song? Miles and miles and miles. You know. So what happens is the dogs barking on the mountain lion. The mountain lion go up the tree, and then the dogs would surround the tree and just be like, rawr, 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 like Bob Marley says about the barking dog. I hate them damn barking dog. Last night. Around, as soon as the sun, as soon as it got dark, my whole, all these neighborhood dogs, I didn't even know they existed, just start going off. Why is that? Is, is that like a thing when it goes dark, the dogs just like spaz out? And one woman was like, was like, had a female named the dog, and she's all like, Mildred, shut up. <laughs> and then she's all like, trying to lure Mildred in. That wasn't her name, Mildred, it just popped in my head. Mildred, do you want this? Do you want to do this? Do you want a little this? I'm trying to like bribe the dog to shut up and come inside. <laughs> anyway, I have my I have my green laser. Where is that thing? Yeah, I have my my newest addition to my laser laser arsenal. I like to call it. So I'm studying the potential. It's a big big bad Cypress Hill Gleeker right there, man. Yeah, right? So I'm all like, bam. And what I've been doing is, like, when it gets dark, the cars come by, you know, way back. Because, way back. And I'm like, y'all see that? I'm like, I hit, I hit the cars, <laughs> and I do a little, dee -dee, and I'm hoping, like, the laser goes on the people trying to drive. It's sort of like, when I was young, I'm sure y'all did this too, but... So like I said, there's a lot of farming around my my hometown. There's a lot of tomatoes. So we would throw tomatoes at the car. <laughs> Friend named Chris Nestor. I'll never forget. Because we had seen some some kind of show. And, and and it was like it was like these black Oh yeah. They wouldn't let these black people swim in the pool for the white people. So um, the black people try to fight back, and the, the white people emptied the pool. Okay? So the black people got, like, some hose, brought it over, and they was all started going like this. Fill that pool, everybody, yeah, yeah, fill that pool, everybody, yeah, yeah, fill that pool. I just, uh, man, I just was stuck on that, you know, get some stuck. And me and my friend Chris Nestor was throwing tomatoes at cars, and every time we hit a car, we'd be like, Feel that pool, everybody, but I feel that pool. <laughs> oh, man, that was great. It's Chris Nestor, man. But, <laughs> a lot of these people I'm mentioning, they don't talk to me no more, man. I don't know, I might, I might have scared them or something. But something, I don't know, man, but they, they don't talk to me. So I mentioned these people, like, they're not my friends. In fact, that kid, Chris Nestor, I think he... When we was playing street hockey, 
probably grade six. He said something like, he said something like, tell your older brother Paul not to bring his marijuana around my older brother Rob. And I'm like, huh? Huh? And, uh, pissed me off. So, we got to fighting because of that. And we waited, though. We didn't fight right then. I was like, all right. We was playing hockey. And I remember, because usually we hit each other against the boards. We didn't try to kill each other. But, but Chris, Chris was one of them tiny dudes, like, like Joey Bartuccia. Chris was just a tiny little skinny dude. And I wasn't, you know. I, I was always one of the bigger dudes. Skinny, but bigger. And he was in the corner, or the rounded corner of a street hockey thing, trying to get at the street hockey ball, and I come flying, man. And I remember, because my friend, my friend started making, like, if they could do a gif on what I did, they would have. Because I came from, like, almost, like, halfway across. And I was, like, I just beamed on this sucker. I was, like, Mmm, bam! I mean, I flattened Chris next door. He was, he crumbled. I saw, his neck went snapping. Blah! He just crumbled to the ground. And he'd get up, he'd bounce right up because he was a tough kid. And he was like, Hey man, what you doing? Why you hit me so hard? And I was like, Well, what? Got a problem with it? And we just, I just went with my glove. Flip! Glove came off. And he was all like, Uh oh, uh oh, because everybody knew. I knew. I knew how to fight. They all knew. You just don't want to mess with Charlie in a fight. It's not like I got a lot of fights, but when I did, I made everybody understand, man, I don't fight often, but if I do, then you're in serious trouble. And as soon as he seen me go, flip, I seen his face. He was like, oh, shit. Well, and then he looked around and said, I guess I got to do it. So, like I said, he was pretty tough. And I'll tell you in a second how tough. So we got into it, and it was, a you know, street hockey and stuff. And, and and he was a little dude, and I was big, I'm just like, bap, bap, bap. I mean, I'm just, I'm tearing this kid up. He's not even getting one shot in on me. I mean, I'm just lighting him up. Blood start flying everywhere, man. He, I, I'm talking about, like, Khabib, Namib Megoff, against, um, against that kickboxer from Brazil. I mean, I was, I was, I almost killed this kid, Chris Nestor. And, um... But he just would not give up. I mean, he just kept coming at me. And, like I said, he was real tough. But, eventually, you know, I don't know, maybe I tired out. You know, but we just knew it was time to stop. But, let me tell you what happened the next day when we got to school. The whole entire, I think it was 8th grade or 7th grade, I don't know. The whole entire, everybody that was supposed to be my friend, I got on... I was put on the blacklist like that. Because basically it was like, Why are you picking on Chris? He just a little old thing. Why you pick why you do his face like that? Cause he came to school. I mean I'm talking like he looked like he looked like the elephant, man. He was all messed up real bad. And I remember because you know how like in middle school in middle school it's not really the boys that that be deciding the, the big things, it's the girl. It's the prettiest girl. And our prettiest girl's name was Jessica Tasto. So it was her decision. She basically told everybody, Charlie is now blacklisted. So nobody talked to me. I think for maybe even an entire year, they put me on probation. Stupid asses. Louis Testa with your big fat self. Mike Midori with your big fat self. They always like feeling so self-important. Man, you, you picked on our, our little... Our little mascot, Chris Nestor. How dare you? How dare you? So, stupid bleepers. Man, how'd I get on that story about Chris Nestor? I don't know, but it's already been an hour. And, um... You know, oh yeah, I, I just was wanted to tell you, I was feeling self-conscious. And I wanted to... I, wanted to, I think when, we, when we're vulnerable, we're feeling vulnerable... That's a good chance to express ourselves to each other. Because we don't want to convey feelings of self-importance. Because there's so much of that going around in these last days. It says it in the Bible. There's going to be self-worshippers. I think that's how the Bible put it. 
It's going to be self-worshippers, self-lovers, you know, people that self-aggrandize, meaning they're always exaggerating their self-worth. Go, go, go watch any of these UFC guys. It's very rare to find someone like Robert Whitaker from New Zealand, but now lives in Australia. He is the most humble dude in all of MMA. So humble. And he's the champ of the middleweight class, man. You know? In fact, I can't wait to see him fight Yoel Romero. You know, soldier of God, because he's a Jesus freak from Cuba. I mean, talk about freak. He's a freaking... He's like a cat. I mean, the way he could... What the flip? What was that? What the flip? Someone please tell me what movie that's from. What was that? What the flip? Please tell me you know what I'm saying. I'll give you a hint. Eddie Murphy is like something in L.A. And then like these Chinese peoples maybe are like, Yo, we need you to find this kid. He's special. And then Eddie Murphy ends up in Nepal or Tibet. And he has to go through these trials. Anyway, his nemesis... The devil incarnate was also looking for the kid because the kid was special. And somebody should know what I'm saying now. The kid was special. Eddie Murphy. Anyway, his nemesis was the devil incarnate. And he had his cohorts. And one of his cohort, like they each had their own little weapon system. One of them looked like a monkey. And when he went to attack Eddie Murphy... He did like the gymnastic thing. The first, it might not have been the monkey looking guy. It might have been someone else. What I'm saying, one of his, the devil's cohorts did the whole gymnastics thing right up to him. And then was like, wow. And then he goes, Eddie Murphy goes, what was that? What the flip? <laughs> I love that, man. Some of the things I remember from movies, you know, just, just classic stuff. Because me and my little brother, James. We used to do it all the time. And he was always better at movie impressions. Yeah, he'd blow me out the water when it comes to movie. You guys could tell I'm not that good at movie impressions. But James was always the best. He would make you laugh all day. He'd be like, what was that? What the flip? Like that movie, uh, uh, Lost Boys. That was filmed in Santa Cruz. It was about the vampire. Yeah, Lost Boys with the vampires. Jason Patrick. The two quarries. Um, there was a scene when um, the head vampire guy, the tall guy, who ran the the, the store where, she, where the mom worked, and she had him over for dinner, and she had to invite him in because he was the head vampire. Remember, you gotta invite vampires in, and so the kids knew he was the head vampire, but the mom didn't want to like. She had, like, cognitive dissonance. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, like, it got to the point where the mom figured it out during the dinner. And the, and the guy who, who, who was normal looking, all of a sudden his face went boom. And it looked like, like a half vampire. And he stuck his tongue out. And he goes, he goes, hey, but I still want you, Lucy. Yeah, my brother used to do that to me all the time. If he seen me that he wanted to crack me up, you know what I'm saying? You know, he'd just come up and be like, <laughs> But I still want you, Lucy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, I, don't, I really don't know why. I think I start, yeah, like I said. I, uh, I just want to show, like if you're feeling a vulnerability, don't be scared to express it via a vlog or a video and publish it. So we can see each other in our, in our naturalnesses and not feel like, not feel like scared, you know, because, 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 because without sounding like self-important, I've had this problem with people, they feel like they can't approach me or talk to me because they're scared, they're like intimidated. And I don't understand why I really, I try to be real chill with people, but it's like, it's like if you express yourself and it's like this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine 
Well, if you let it shine a little bit too bright or brighter than, than what they're used to, they'll get scared and they won't come talk to you and you'll think, man, what did I do? But it's really just them being, being, uh, worrying about the fact that, that they can't hang with you for some weird reason. And I don't want that. So I'm trying to publish vulnerabilities. And this is not a really that good example. But what I wanted to say about Joey Bartuccio was, one of his many skills is he was a barber. And one day he came over to my house and he put me in my chair and he was like, man, you need a trim trim. And he did my goatee different than normal people would just do their goatee. He did with the trim bzz, bzz, and he made like the little line. And I tried to do that. I tried to mimic it. I tried to do the I smile. He made me smile like that. And he just went beep, beep, beep. Beat, and then he chiseled all around and it was like the best I ever seen myself I went and he goes go look in the mirror I looked in the mirror and I was like BAM and I remember saying Joey you gotta come with me I was going somewhere I was like probably New Zealand like I said I've been I've been on this New Zealand thing since 1995 man John, John gave me New Zealand in 1995 that didn't give it to me he said you need to conquer it because that's where that's, the, that's going to be the safety realm. Okay, when, when WW3 pop off, you know, that's going to be the safety zone. Alright, for my peoples. You know. So, yeah, that was 1995, you know. Anyway. So, I was like, oh, there it goes. There it goes. So, that was overtime, you guys. That's the overtime period of this hockey game. And that's why, exactly why, I'm going to go ahead and, and call it. An hour 16. I'm going to call it. And just tell you, yeah, because Joey Bartuccio, he did it real nice. And I was like, wow. And I said to him, Joey, I got to take you with me so you can be my personal barber. And I remember the look on his face was like, yeah, well, thanks for the compliment. But, I mean, I don't exactly see myself as being your personal barber. <laughs> and I didn't mean it like that. I really didn't. And he knows that. But, you know, some things, you know, you just say stuff and... Anyway, it's a good shout out to Joey. Hope you're doing well. I'll try to send you this. You know, I'll try to look you up. I'll try to send you this. I'll give you a little plug, plug, a little, a little. What do you call it on Facebook? A little, a little tag, tag, a little shout out. My man Joey Bartuccio from Hamilton, New Jersey. I hope you're doing well, my brother. And you know, I, I, I kind of want to say, I hope you're not dead. And I know why is that natural for me to say? Well. You know that whole thing about like the sins of your father? Like I've been trying to tell you, my, my little Italian Sicilian town is all crazy mobbed up. Crazy mobbed up. I mean, just watch that, that show, Boardwalk Empire, about the Pine Barrens. You know, we, we was mobbed up. And a lot of kids in my class, the class of um, 1992, a lot of us is gone. We, and not just 1992, a lot of that from, I'm going to say from 88, to 94 but I have no idea I mean it could be people from class of 2000 but we was dropping like flies all from heroin overdosing you know because Philly Philly heroin is the most powerful they they did they, they, they test it because when, when when heroin comes in typically what the way it used to be you know back this is a long time ago but it used to come in you know from Marseille France to New York and Philadelphia, I mean, so yeah, obviously from Philadelphia, when it goes wherever it goes, they're going to start, um, what you call it, you know, cutting it, but the most powerful, obviously, was where it first come in, so Philly dope was the most powerful, so, but that's not, I mean, that could be one reason we was dropping like flies, but another reason could be because of the sins of our fathers, I don't know, I really don't know, but it just came in my mind, and I, you know, so that's why it's like, Joey, I hope you're still alive because our friend Nicky Malazzo, he's gone. He's been gone for a long time. His little brother, Danny Malazzo, he's gone too. And Danny wasn't even into heroin like like we was all into heroin. But I think Danny maybe was like, let me see what Nicky was, why was he into this heroin? And then he's sleeping too now. And, and I keep saying sleeping because let me tell you, when we die, basically... One of two things happens, okay? If you're well saved in the blood of Jesus, then your soul go up to heaven 
and you're with Jah and Jesus, okay? But if you're not well saved, then he put you to sleep, and that's called limbo. You're just sleeping. You're just in a deep sleep, you know, deep, 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 deep sleep. You ain't waking up. So that's why these people are talking about contacting spirits that have died, the grandmoms. No, 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 no. Okay, let me be clear. That is not your grandmoms. Those are fallen angels, demonias, demons, messing witches. Okay, they're just messing witches. And those that tell other people that they're talking to spirits, wouldn't want to be y'all. I'm telling you, wouldn't want to be misleading people like that. I mean, for what are you getting out of it exactly? Like, people think you're all cool or you're getting a lot of money and fancy stuff. I mean, is that really worth all that suffering and hell you're going to be doing? Just stock up on anti-burn gel. Keep telling people, better get some super sunscreens and anti-burn gels because the fire going to get hot. But, my point being, yeah, so if I'm like, Joey, I hope you're still alive, you know, I say that, I mean it, because it took Nikki, took Danny, I mean, if I just, the list just goes on and on, you know, so, yeah. Alright, that's it, you guys, look, an, an hour 20, so yeah, it was, a, it was a hockey game, one overtime, period, and that's it, signing out, I'm going to leave it right there. Okay, here's how I'm going to leave it. Hear the words of the Rasta man. Baby line is all fall down, fall down. Baby line is all fall down. See the angels with the seven seals Baby line is all fall down fall down Baby line is all fall down There you go Go look it up on your Spotify or Tidal or Amazon Music Bob Marley Rasta Man Chant Listen carefully to the natural mystic blowing through the air because if you listen carefully you will what you will hear you will hear yes that's it signing out hockey game overtime period commenced